Hi, so in this video, I'm going to talk about what are the technologies which are available right now through which you can make your mobile app and which is the best technology to pick in 2024 to make your mobile app business as a success. So currently, if you are an experienced developer or a new developer who is trying to learn mobile app development in this video, by the end of it, you will know which is the best technology which suits you right now. Either it's a product which your company is building or you are trying to build your own app. So this video will clear out a lot of your doubts like which technology you should pick. So let me first start with my own experience. So I'm Divyanshu. I have 11 years of experience building mobile apps, web apps and backend. And I have extensively worked on mobile app ecosystem. I started back in 2012 when the mobile app ecosystem was just bubbling up and uh, it's been 12 years making mobile app. I have seen this transition from moving from native to cross platform and the technology which exists right now. When I started back in 2012, like almost 11 years or 12 years ago from now, there were only two ways to develop mobile app. The one was the native way and another was a cross platform way, but that was not actually very production ready. We used to have like a web app uh, version of a mobile app that was not at all useful. And nowadays like those frameworks have long gone. Some of the frameworks which were available back then was PhoneGap, Cordova and Xamarin. Xamarin still exists, but I have never seen any production ready or any big company using it. I used to code in Android like with Java programming language and in, in iOS, you have to use Objective-C. I've always been scared uh, how bad Objective-C can be sometimes in terms of its syntax. It's a very beautiful language and I know a couple of like uh, expert developers who enjoy writing in Objective-C. But for me, coming from JavaScript background, moving to Java and learning all the object oriented part of it, Objective-C always felt a little bit more complicated. So the number one which we will discuss is the native way. And first we will discuss about Android app development. So if you are making an Android app, this is the segment for you. So nowadays Android apps are built using programming language called Kotlin. So Android moved from building in Java to Kotlin and Kotlin is a programming language which was built by JetBrains. JetBrains is the same company which created the IDE, which is Android Studio right now, which is used to build uh, mobile apps in Android. That company created an ID called IntelliJ and IntelliJ is the one which was like forked a little bit, changed by Google and was published as Android Studio. Now what is Android Studio? Android Studio is an ID. It's similar to if you know about VS Code or Notepad++ or any other ID where you write the code. Android Studio is similar uh, code writing development environment but it does provide some of the helpful plugins like debugger, performance enhancer, simulators, all these things. So it makes your mobile app development experience much, much more faster, secure. The transition from Java to Kotlin was done because Kotlin is much like it's, it's much better to read. It can be compiled into like the JVM code, which JVM can understand. And the best part of Kotlin is you can have interoperable programming in the same project. So you can write some files in Java, some files in Kotlin, and all of this will be compiled into the code without giving any error, like into the app without giving any error. So Kotlin is also a declarative programming language. If you want to create UI elements, like if you want to draw something on the app, like you want to show a menu bar, or you want to show a toolbar, or you want to show an alert, you have to, like when I was coding back in like 2010 or 10, 11 years back, I was writing in XML. So XML format, you write like linear layout, relative layout. You have to create these layouts in a XML file. And that is then come like converted into a UI, which Android can show as an app. But nowadays, uh, Android has moved to creating it with a new framework they call Jetpack Compose. So with Jetpack Compose, you can write your UI elements using a very good Kotlin syntax. And it's a declarative framework. So you have to write very less code compared to how many use cases it can handle. Kotlin plus Jetpack Compose is the latest native way which you, with which you can create Android apps. So as we are talking about the native apps, now moving on to the iOS apps, what are the options? So again, moving back to 10 years back, uh, iOS app were built using Objective-C. Uh, the UI framework from which you have to write the UI was called UI Kit. So UI Kit was a very uh, interesting kind of a UI creation framework. Actually, you have to draw, drag and drop things like you do in Figma or any other uh, designing tool. It was not that simple, but still you can just directly link buttons to each other. You can put the navigations from one place to another. You could do it in the code as well, but UI kit as a framework was available in Xcode, which is an ID for creating iOS apps. Xcode is shipped by Apple and you cannot run it in any other operating system other than like Mac. 
So you definitely need a Mac if you want to build a native iOS app. And Xcode is the only ID available with which you can write these iOS apps. So there are a lot of good things about Xcode. Uh, it does provide a lot of Again, other uh, tools which makes your app development journey a much simpler. Like it provides you the debugger, it provides you the testing tools, it provides you the simulator. So all these things are directly uh, bundled into this ID. That's why Xcode is the number one ID to create iOS apps. Now in the developer community, it's not very well known. Like people have a like love-hate relationship with it. Mostly hate relationship with it because of how many things it still lacks. Uh, still in 2024, uh, it does not have the code completion tools or either any like a plugin or extension ecosystem as such. iOS actually moved to Swift programming language in 2014, which is a more advanced programming language compared to Objective-C. And it's again, it's quite similar to how Kotlin is, but Kotlin was created in 2018. So, well, Kotlin could have been inspired by Swift syntax, but they both share the similar syntax to each other. So if you understand or learn one language, it becomes a little bit easier to get into the other ecosystem. That was not the case when we were creating apps in Java or in Objective-C. So if you want to create a native iOS app, I would suggest you start with Swift. Well, that, that's the only option right now. And the new framework for creating UI is not UIKit, it's Swift UI. Swift UI is not a new programming language, it's just a framework which iOS released, which again, uh, Jetpack Compose is again very heavily inspired by that and they both share similar kind of syntax. So it's a declarative UI syntax in which you write some Swift code and the UI, UI is created. Now, uh, they also provide a preview window. So if you are writing your Swift UIs, you can watch how the UI looks like in real time, which is called like hot reloading. Uh, if you come from a web ecosystem, when you change something on your code and the web app refreshes automatically, that's what happens when you're building your apps in iOS or in Android and you change your Jetpack Compose code or your Swift UI code, you see the real time changes. Okay, so far we are very good, right? So you know that the native way, Android way is create using Kotlin and you can use Jetpack Compose to create your UI. And on the iOS side, you can use Swift and Swift UI as creating your UI. So very good. No like problem with it. They are provided directly by Apple provides the uh, Swift UI framework and Google provides the Jetpack Compose framework. They are pretty mature at this point and a lot of companies just directly using them in the production apps. And if you want to have a very smooth experience of your user and use the latest uh, like UI libraries, these are the best available right now in the market. Okay, so now let's move on to the cross platform. So you write just once, maintain one code base, but your app runs on both Android and iOS. And I know you would be more happy uh, this way because I am. I always love when you can just write less and serve to a lot of more user base. It comes with its own pros and cons, which we will discuss later in this video. But for now, let's know what are the other ways. So the number one way to create cross-platform app is React Native. Now, React Native was released by Facebook in 2015. It was created in a hackathon in a weekend. They tried to create uh, bring the whole component building framework, which was called React into mobile ecosystem. So they thought React Native could be it. So React Native basically is nothing. It's a very clever way. You write an abstract layer of JavaScript and internally you have written a bridge, which is called React Native Bridge. And that communicates with the native layer. So whenever I have to show an alert box, for example, in my app, I am actually showing a native alert box, which is which I can show with the native code. But to trigger that alert, box i'm using the javascript code so javascript code is the logical layer which tells what to do but it tells it to the native layer so native layer can perform the actions internally on the device so the smoothness and the animations and the flows are always very smooth except for it that the bridge is the center communication piece so sometimes if your app is doing a lot of communication back and forth the bridge becomes like a bottleneck in that case your app can have some performance issues but it's not the case most of the time as I know and the ecosystem for React Native has grown like crazy right now. Now, if you're building in React Native, there is another very beautiful framework which is called Expo. It's not a new framework. It's just that Expo tried to abstract more of what React Native was. So if you're a React Native developer, you have to do a lot of uh, native code management as well. You have to have the Android code base and iOS code base in the same project. So what Expo team thought, most of the code looks almost similar. So they just packaged it together into their servers and then you just have to write the JavaScript code. It becomes super easy for a web developer then to create a mobile app. So you can build using Expo with its own pre-built plugins and frameworks, which are more abstracted layer 
you you do not even have to use the one uh, bare bone libraries which react native provides so with expo it becomes much easier if you are into react native ecosystem you're building a mobile app i couldn't uh, like recommend anything except for expo another example of an uh, like how expo could be useful is for example if you want to add a push notification system into your app right so push notification is a pretty complex it can become pretty complex and if you have to configure a lot of things in ios native app and you have to configure a lot of things in android native app and then you have to write the javascript layer of it in react native but if you are using expo you can just use their notification library from expo and with just one line of code your both the apps both android and ios app can have a notification system similarly there are other plugins or SDKs they have created which just abstract away all the logic and all the hard work for you. So this is what React Native is. Uh, React Native is one of my personal favorite because I come from the React background. I have I know how to create web apps in React. So it becomes like a no brainer. If I have to choose to build a mobile app, I can write just the same logic which I have written in the web app. Now coming back to the second cross platform framework, which is quite popular and it's called Flutter. Not like I'm not a huge fan of it, but I can explain what it is about. So Flutter is basically created by Google. And Google wanted to compete into this cross-platform uh, war which was running back in 2016 or 2017 when Flutter was launched. So Flutter, first thing is you have to learn a new programming language which is called Dart. Dart is again created by Google. It's quite similar in syntax to Java and Kotlin to, in my opinion. And the UI which you write is quite similar to how you write in Jetpack Compose and Swift UI. Jetpack Compose, Swift UI and Flutter. They all share kind of similar UI creation system. The underlying technology, how the app works is again, pretty, pretty interesting, right? So what they do basically Flutter, once you open a Flutter app, it's just a blank canvas which opens. Now Flutter has written all the widgets, all the tools and all the UIs which get painted onto your blank canvas. So for example, if I have to show an alert box in native app or in React Native app, we will show the alert box which comes in Android or in iOS automatically in the native code, right? But with Flutter, they will try to simulate what the native code would have shown. So it's like alert box is drawn specifically in Flutter because the Flutter team has written that alert box. The funny part is you can technically show the iOS alert box in Android because nobody is stopping you. It's not using the internal SDK's alert box. The UI is not native. It's rendered on a canvas which is created by the Flutter team which simulates and looks like the iOS. So which makes two things possible. One is it's super, super customizable. You can make very, very super complex UIs with Flutter because technically there is no limit what you can draw, what you can't draw. Secondly, the performance increases a lot because it uses an Ischia engine, which is very fast as rendering and uh, doing these animations and everything. So you get like 60 FPS in your animations. The downside is, for example, a new library or Android upgrades to a new design system, then Flutter team or any other in the community has to manually write every component by themselves. Otherwise, you cannot use those native UIs which directly comes baked in into any OS of iOS or either in Android OS. Uh, Flutter reached to a huge mass very quickly, uh, very fast. And uh, that was that was the reason because it was super easy to create these complex UIs and a lot of companies chose it. Plus, object-oriented Dart programming language makes it a bit easier on the security and, uh, well, less bugs that way. If you are talking about Flutter, one important news is recently Google has also fired a couple of team members from their Flutter team and with the history of abandoning the projects. On the other hand, React Native has matured to a very huge level at this point and there is another competitor which is we will talk about now. So the final cross-platform framework is called Kotlin Multi-Platform. It's one of my favorite and I have also worked on it for a banking company I was working for. Basically, when you're writing the native code in iOS or in Android, most of the logic which you write is almost similar, right? So what KMM does is Kotlin Multi-Platform, you write your whole logic in Kotlin, like the, your data layer, your API layer, your business layer, your model layer, everything you write in Kotlin and you compile this and use both in iOS and Android. So basically your logical part, which you have to use, you just share it both ways. You only have to write the UI twice. You still have to write the UI in iOS with Swift UI and in Android with the Jetpack Compose. But you can share that library, which you have written with KMM and you can share both ways. So you do not have to spend too much time on writing the same logic on two platforms. So it reduces your time to ship, but 
you also get the benefit of the whole uh, smoothness and flowness of the native code base. So it, it's a win-win situation both ways. But again, it is still the UI you have to write yourself. That's the power of Kotlin multi-platform. For example, with the company which I was working for, they were building like a, just a single app which they can sell to multiple banks. They were trying to sell it to multiple banks and each bank has the UI a little bit different, but the core logic is usually the same. So what we did, we wrote this KMM modules for them and we shipped these KMM modules to different UI teams who are building like the iOS native or like the Android native. They can use our KMM module because all the calls in the banking system are almost always same. So yeah, this is how KMM can be useful. So these are the all the four ways of building mobile app. One is the native way, another is a cross-platform. In cross-platform, you have like three different frameworks right now. There are other frameworks, but I don't know much about them, never use them. I have used extensively all these five systems. And in iOS, I'm a big fan of SwiftUI, how fast and how fluid you can make it. But if you have to ship or write just once and ship to everything, uh, React Native is my always my go-to choice. Also, like there is no right or wrong framework. It just depends on what you want to do. If you are really good at Dart or uh, Java and you want to write for both the platforms, you cannot go wrong with Flutter. If you are really good at JavaScript and you already know React, you cannot go wrong with React Native. So thank you so much for watching this video. And if you think this was uh, helpful, please uh, drop a like, comment and do subscribe to it. And if possible, like share with some of the people you think this video would make more sense. Thank you so much. I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.